Thanks very much. I've really been looking forward to uh, to this symposium, and I was very pleased that uh, Moon and the team uh, accepted the paper to get in. Uh, with my new institutional home in Chicago at a business school, uh, I don't get lots of opportunities to interact with people who are uh, really getting uh, down and dirty uh, in the kinds of settings and, 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 and empirical context that we're talking about today, and, and as well as uh, having the balance between the academic approach and the uh, and the policymaking focus uh, is also really important to me. So I've been, been looking forward to uh, to sharing uh, snippets of the uh, of the project that I've been building now for uh, for a few years uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is the growth of the domestic stock market participation in Kenya as a function of social ties within Kenyan society the extent to which Kenyans are sharing information with each other about the desirability the benefits of share ownership uh, in the expanding uh, domestic uh, domestic uh, stock market there is, uh, as, as most of us are, I'm sure, are familiar with, uh, the literature on ethnic fractionalization and the extent to which it limits uh, economic development by way of limiting uh, support for investment in public goods, instead favoring uh, 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 consumption of private goods within a particular social group. And what I want to do is I want to sort of take this perspective that addresses divisions between social groups and contentions between social groups uh, and ratchet it up a little bit to the study uh, of uh, the formation uh, or the construction uh, of a national stock market. Uh, and of, of course, I'm going to show you uh, that in the context of, of Kenya. Specifically, I'm going to look at the role of informal social networks within Kenyan society uh, at the tribal level and look at the extent to which investors who are uh, buying shares in the Kenyan market and making money or losing money uh, seem to be sharing that information with anybody who's around them, or are they more exclusively sharing that information uh, just with members of their own tribe. So the extent to which material information about participation in this market seems to be getting segmented or pooled, clustered, locked into these discrete social groups and therefore limiting uh, the spread of, of information more broadly, which is what we uh, would probably prefer as we're trying to build, uh, build, a, uh, build a national market. And if we see patterns in the clustering of this kind of information, of social segmentation in this investing uh, population, are there tools available to policymakers to try to break that free? Okay, because what we're, what we're dealing with is the tension between the ability of same social group members to legitimate a new practice to each other, which is positive for the spread of a new practice, and if you're selling, uh, or if you're pushing things like drought insurance or crop insurance, livestock insurance in a local community, this can be very effective. But if you're trying to build a national market, then clustering of, of influence and clustering of information in small social groups would be detrimental, uh, and we want to look for ways to maybe break uh, break that, that pattern. Very brief history of the Nairobi Securities Exchange, founded in 1953 by British colonialists. Indigenous Kenyans were excluded from participation until in, uh, independence in 63. Post-independence, for many decades, participation is largely focused among Kenyan elite. Uh, shares in companies that are listing on the stock exchange are largely sold off in large lots to politically connected uh, wealthy Kenyans, and we have very little public participation. In the late 80s, a USA delegation called the NSE a stock exchange in name only due to extremely low participation rates uh, and therefore low levels of liquidity in the secondary market. The Privatization Act of 2005 sought to address this and change this. It was a regulatory shift where now the state-run uh, regulatory agency had control over share prices for new IPOs and they could force listing companies to offer IPOs at low-cost buy-ins such that that the financial barrier to entry was virtually eliminated for the, for the average Kenyan. So the price of participation dropped considerably, and they also enforced high allotments of shares to be held for retail investors rather than larger institutional investors. Uh, and they followed the Privatization Act of 2005 with seven carefully chosen IPOs over the course of three years, with lots of advertising as well to communicate uh, the availability of the, of the practice to the public. And this is the change in domestic participation you get in Kenya. All right, quick note, you're probably wondering about foreigners. Foreigners are less than 1% of all investors. During the time period I'm going to study, they own about 12% of market value. So they're in there as owners, uh, for sure, as, terms, uh, as far as uh, 
numbers of market participants, they're quite scarce. So uh, we see here at the time of the passage of the Privatization Act in 2005, we've got approximately We've got approximately 140,000 Kenyans owning shares uh, in the market. Uh, then you have la the launch of uh, the seven IPOs, and we see the total number of domestic uh, shareholding uh, accounts in Kenya growing to about 1.5 million. About a 10 times increase in the number of investors over the course of about three years. Uh, Back of the envelope calculation with 2.5 million households in Kenya earning more than $5 a day, we've got about 60% of households earning uh, more than double the poverty wage now invested in shares in the market. And of course, this is happening in an environment uh, of very weak property rights uh, and very little use of other formal financial products like uh, bank accounts, credit cards, pensions, insurance products, that sort of thing. If we take this growth, in investor participation, and we break it into the seven IPOs that occurred after the Privatization Act, we see a lot of differential recruitment of new investors in each of these seven IPOs. The gray bars here are the subscription periods leading up to the launch of each IPO, where, it potential, where investors visit a stockbroker's office, they open an account with a stock exchange, they write a check for the number of shares they want to subscribe for, and the black lines here are the daily number of new investing accounts accounts that are opened uh, in the stock market. And then the red line, of course, is our growth in the total number of participants. Those of you familiar with the context, of course, this is Safaricom. We get 600,000 new investors entering the Kenyan market as a result of the privatization of the, of the telecom itself. But we've got a state-owned electrical utility company here. You've got EverReady Bat Batteries East Africa, which is a very publicly visible company. But you see a lot of differential recruitment of new investors across these different, these different IPOs. We also see a huge shift in the type of, of Kenyan or the, 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 the income level of Kenyans that are owning shares pre and post privatization act. If we look at the percentile of investors in two groups, our 140,000 investors who own shares before 2006 and the 1.4 million that came into the market as a result of this dramatic rise, and we plot the percentiles of each of those groups according to the value, the, the, the nominal cash value of the initial investment they make. We see large shareholding, like high, high portfolio values among our 140,000 pre-existing investors. But among the 1.4 million new investors recruited into the market, you have to get above the 50th percentile before you get a portfolio value that exceeds two weeks' wages at double the poverty rate. Right? They are recruiting a very wide swath of the Kenyan public, but it is a very thin level of portfolio value. And this has actually created quite a few problems for listing companies, given that there's regulation that you have to print and mail an annual report to each investor each year. So for example, the CFO at EverReady Batteries East Africa told me that those kinds of regulatory requirements, just printing and mailing annual reports to all of your investors when you have uh, what they get, 125,000 investors consumed 40% of corporate profits in the first three years after listing. It's extremely, extremely expensive. Ah, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Ah. Okay, lots of, lots, of, uh, lots of maps here, George. I'll, well, I'll be gentle, we'll, we'll, we'll do this together. We'll do this together. <laughs> All right, 140,000 investors in this market before the Privatization Act and before the expansion. Okay, if you ask virtually anyone, where do these 140,000 investors live? Right? You would be crazy to say anything other than these people live in Nairobi. Right? The CEO of the stock exchange, the CEO of the regulatory agency, I pose this question to every single person I can, I can pose this question to. Where do these 140,000 seeds, where do they live? Everybody says they start in Nairobi. And when you go from 140,000 to 1.5 million, the practice is dis diffusing across the country. I'll explain where I get the data in a little bit, but here's a, a mapping of the towns, villages, and cities where Kenyan investors live, okay? And if we look at just our 140,000 investors as of December 2005, these are the towns, villages, and cities across the, the country where they, where they are registered. This is where they live, okay? There was actually a wide distribution in shareholding across communities uh, across Kenya, right? And here we're at this point uh, in our adoption curve. And if we look at this change over time as we recruit more and more investors into the market, 
market. Fast forward to uh, after the fifth IPO, this is late uh, 2007, I believe. We're halfway through our adoption curve. We've gone from 366 towns to 499 towns, right? Which is non-trivial, but if you can pick out the new towns over here, then you have better eyes than I do, right? We're talking about villages that are located very close to towns where uh, existing investors already live. So we can look at the spread, or I should say that the increased rise in participation in the stock market in Kenya as part of a geographic diffusion process, and there really isn't one, right? It's not, the practice isn't spreading across the country. It's deepening within the communities where investors uh, already already live. And so just coming up with this graphic uh, was quite stunning to me as I started studying this process because it really sort of changed, changed the, the theoretical orientation I had uh, uh, to, uh, to, this, to what's going on here. Uh, compare that against the population density of Kenya itself, right? It's no surprise that you get uh, most investors living uh, in, the, in the parts of Kenya where, where, there's, where there's greater concentration of, of households. Where I'm going with this is to look at intertribal effects of information sharing or intertribal patterns in information sharing. And so what I like to do is I like to compare my map of towns and villages where investors actually live to uh, this map from the 1970s that the CIA had up on its website some time ago. And what you see is that most investors live in these areas that are populated by close clustering of diverse tribal groups. And we see that uh, in the difference between blue, red, yellow, that sort of thing. But we also see them through the Rift Valley, which most of us are very familiar with, high population densities here. This is the sort of pale green area through here that the CIA uh, sort of aptly labels area of extremely complex tribal and ethnic mixture. Right? <laughs> we have investors from different tribes, sometimes rival tribes, living in very close proximity to each other. And I want to get a handle on the extent to which they're sharing information each other, with each other, given the fact that distrust between between tribes in Kenya is very much the norm. 2005 Afrobarometer survey asks, how much do you trust Kenyans from other tribal groups? The answer is not that much, right? So we've got a rich setting here where we've got a huge increase in adoption of a practice. So there's gonna be a lot of information moving through the social system about the, ben the advantages or disadvantages of participation in a place where people tend to not trust socially dissimilar others. And it should give us some variation to, uh, to work with. The specific theoretical question I'm getting after uh, with this has to do with the expected amount of information flow and inf influence between socially similar and socially dissimilar others. This is an extremely well-developed literature within sociology that the diffusion of new practices and especially uncertain practices are largely legitimated by referencing socially similar others who are already participating in the practice. Okay? And if all you're trying to do is sell widgets, and the more widgets the better, this can really work to your advantage. Plant the seed with some socially influential person, and they'll influence others around them. And again, if you're trying to do you know, crop insurance or something like that at the local level, it can, be, it can work really well. But it might not be desirable when you're trying to build a national level market, right? And you actually want free information flow throughout the market, right? So that you, you not only get more even patterns of investor recruitment, but then in the secondary market, you might get more even spread uh, of information through the, through the population. So it's not going to be theoretically surprising to find this. There's a large literature that socially similar people influence each other. Where I'm trying to go is in trying to break that pattern. Right? Thinking of taking the, me the theoretical mechanisms we understand from sociology to more of a, of a policy application perspective to say this is a social reality in every social system around the world. What can we do to break it? Right? How can we get people to start listening and being sensitive to material information that's being broadcast by socially dissimilar others? So we get some testable questions here. What is the relative influence of tribally similar versus tribally different other Kenyans in spreading information about the benefits of shareholding. And specifically, I'm going to ask which group, that is, same tribe or different tribe, which group's profits from the previous IPO are influencing new investor recruitment in the next IPO, right? Your next door neighbor invested in shares in the last IPO. They made money. They lost money. 
do you buy shares in the next IPO as a function of whether or not you're the same tribe or, or different tribe? And then what elements of local context will reduce this social bias uh, in influence. And then uh, time allowing, I'm going to very quickly give you uh, a snippet from another set of papers that I'm working on, which is the effects of corruption in also altering social diversity within the market. Does fraud dis disproportionately affect investor confidence uh, in, different, uh, in different tribal groups? I hope I have t uh, a couple minutes at the end to talk about that. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an empirical strategy that looks at the, no that predicts the number of new investors in each IPO, in each town in Kenya. So the unit of analysis is going to be the town. But first, I want to uh, net out the effects of the listing firm, right? We know that telecoms attract more investors. We know that privatizations attract more investors, right? We know that small private companies attract fewer investors. So I want to net out the attributes of each of the seven listing firms. I want to net out the attributes of the local communities. I want to take out wealth, uh, use of other formal financial products, right? All of these things that we know uh, are associated with share ownership, and I want to focus on how much money investors made in the last IPO. And there's a great disparity in the uh, share price of each of these IPOs, and I've graphed it here. I've indexed them all to 100 over the days of secondary trading, and so each of these lines representing the share price for each of these IPOs ends at the start of the next IPO. So when the next IPO launches, you've got some that are trading at more than 300% of original listing price. You've got two that are trading below original listing price, right? This gray line right here, in case you're interested, this is the Safaricom debacle, okay? The data set that allows me to do this is rather unique. So beyond the results themselves, let me proselytize a little bit about data source here. The Nairobi Stock Exchange operates on a centralized electronic platform. There's no paper share certificates anymore. They've been doing this since November of 2004. What it means is that there's a single computer on the 10th floor of the Nation Center building in downtown Nairobi that houses every single transaction in the market, and it houses the registration database that tells you the name, age, address, address an entire trading history of every investor in the market. And I have been very fortunate to be granted access to this database, conditional on protecting the, uh, the identities uh, of these 1.5 million shareholders. What this data allows me to do is it allows me to see the timing of market entry for all 1.5 million investors. When did they buy their first shares? I see the town of residence where they live, its self-reported mailing address where they register, and I match it to Census Bureau uh, database of, of all known Kenyans, uh, Kenyan cities, towns, and villages. With this data, I can calculate daily, hourly, minutely, secondly, whatever uh, level of analysis you want to get at, portfolio values and compositions. Right? I see all the changes in share prices in the market at all times, so I can calculate each individual investor's portfolio value and composition. I can therefore see the returns that they've made on all of these investments. So I know how much money they've made or lost in the last IPO that they participated in, and then there's other things in the database that are provided, but I don't think actually have quite that much validity. Gender and age are actually quite problematic. I see things in the database that suggest that there's a lot of Kenyan men that are opening uh, accounts in their mother-in-law's name or their wife's name, and, and the age stuff is, uh, is real messy, so I don't use that either. I then, to this database, I match survey data at the town level from two different surveys, the 2005 Integrated Household Budget Survey and the 2006 Fin Access Survey survey uh, from this organization I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Financial Sector Deepening Kenya. This gives me attributes of the communities where these Kenyans live. Right? And I, am, I use this data first to code for inner town tribal similarity, because each of the respondents to these surveys can choose the language that they want to respond to the survey in. I can get a pretty reasonable measure of the tribal composition of each of these towns, and I can therefore measure at the town level the tribal similarity between any town I and any town J, and it's merely the sum of the proportions of each town's population that belong to each of 14 different 
different tribal groups. Right? So it allows me a basic measure of if I pluck one person from this town and one person from that town, what is the probability that they belong to the same tribe? Right? What's that expected level of tribal connectivity between two towns? I can also measure other attributes like local wealth based on conditions of the dwelling, who's got a dirt floor, who has all the amenities like a flush uh, toilet and piped water, et cetera, et cetera. So we get a sense of the amount of wealth that's, uh, that's housed in each town. The at-risk population in each town is the town's total population minus the percentage of the town's population that lives with a dirt floor minus the number of existing investors uh, that already live in that town. It, gets you a, it gives you a measure of the at-risk set uh, of potential investors that live in each town. Use of other formal financial products is taken from the 2006 Fin Access Survey. It's the percentage of town residents that report having used any number of formal financial products. And then I worked with a market research firm, Sinovate, to measure exposure to IPO advertising. Uh, so I get a, 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 a a nice valid measure here of radio advertising campaigns that were broadcast that were broadcast on each radio station during each of these IPOs. And then we can track the geographic footprint of each of these radio stations. So we get a nice measure of how much external advertising the, the town was uh, the town was exposed to. I have two measures of, of, of profit, right, or prior experience that a person in Kenya might be exposed to. The amount of profit earned by people who belong to the same tribe as them, and the amount of profit earned by people who belong to different uh, tribes than they do, right? I consider these two distinct sources of potential information. Everybody around me is investing in shares and making or losing money, right? I'm going to slice that total population into two groups, the people who belong to my tribe who are making money and everybody else, and I'm going to look at the relative influence of each of these groups. The full model uh, has these two key explanatory variables, a host of controls here, including firm fixed effects, tribal fixed effects. Uh, and a range of other town attributes that we think would, uh, would uh, in impact willingness to buy shares. So I'm not going to give you 20 tables of regression coefficients, good for all of us. What I am going to do is just show you the, the, the interpreted results from the fully specified model. We've got the profits, positive or negative, earned by each peer group and their relationship to the ratio of new investors recruited in each town. Positive for both, the profit earned by tribal peers and the profit earned by non-tribal peers. So as each of these peer groups is making more and more money on earlier investments, the number of new investors is, is increasing, which we would absolutely expect. The takeaway from this slide is that the effect of socially similar co-tribal prior investors has a higher magnitude effect on the recruitment of new investors. People are either hearing the information more from co-tribals or they hear everybody's information, but what they hear from co-tribals actually feels relevant to them. Yeah, okay, I know that my, my tribal rivals made, made money in the, in the stock market last time, but that's what they do. That's not really what I do, right? That's what this is, that's what this is suggesting to us, is that, when, is that this, is our, our, this is our social segmentation of, of, of material information in this marketplace. So we're, and, and we see this uh, sort of overall in the proportion of the Kenyan population population that belongs e to each of these tribes, and the proportion of investors, uh, of, of each tribe's proportion of investors in the market before the expansion in investor participation and after, and these columns are very stable. Right? We see the Kikuyu at 17% of Kenyan population, but comprising about half of all investors. And this pattern doesn't really change, even though we've recruited about 60% of above poverty households uh, in Kenya. And so we, I think we see a couple, that both in, in sort of uh, uh, regression results uh, and in descriptive statistics that suggest that we've got a lot of social segmentation going on in this market. So what we want to do is we want to look at attributes of local communities that are making this better or attenuating it. And so what what I do is I interact the size of the local investing population with the hypothesis that maybe you grow out of this bias. 
right? That, that, uh, that uh, discrimination in information should get priced out of markets over time. And so as investor participation increases, maybe you get less of this social bias in information. That actually turns out to not be true. But then we also think it might vary by high versus low wealth within a, con uh, within a town, the amount of advertising that it's exposed to, or the level of tribal homogeneity in the town. And what we see is, or at least what the data is suggesting so far, and this analysis is really quite new, is that this social segmentation uh, of influence is actually increasing with the size of the local investing population. So instead of growing out of the bias, it seems to be entrenching itself uh, in communities. We also interestingly see an, uh, uh, an effect of advertising of, of uh, deepening this social segmentation, which I thought was interesting. I thought if you give them more ex, uh, sort of exogenous information into the community, right, it should open them up a little bit. So I started asking around about the content of these advertising campaigns. It turns out that the radio advertising campaigns are largely done by funding local radio personalities who do sort of talk shows and that sort of thing, which are done in the local tribal vernacular. So you actually have an advertising campaign that is speaking to the, the, the social segmentation uh, e existing within Kenyan society. Things that seem to make it better, low income towns seem to be less influenced by this bias source, right? Poor people can't afford to discriminate, I think, is the short version of, of that story. Uh, and interestingly, we also see an attenuation uh, of this social segmentation in tribally homogeneous towns. If I have 60 seconds? Yeah, all right. If I have 60 seconds, I'll show you a quick uh, bit of results from a recent stockbroker uh, scandal. Uh, in March of 2008, Kenya's largest stock brokerage, which handled 20% of all investors in the market at the time, 100,000 clients, was shut down by regulators because they were stealing cash and shares out of their clients' accounts. This uh, corrupt stock brokerage was owned and operated by members of the Kikuyu tribe, which I'm sure most of you know is, is economically and politically very influential in Kenya, but they had clients that ranged over the entire tribal population. So I've got a couple of papers that look at, one, which clients get stolen from. You've got a corrupt Kikuyu broker. Are they stealing from Kikuyu or are they stealing from everybody else? Right? What's the social influence here? But then also, what's the effect of this theft? Right? Are these different, are investors in these different tribal groups, do they take the news, some of them take it harder, some of them take it not so hard? The short version of the story is that they disproportionately share from members of their own tribe. Right? And there's theoretical reasons to expect that. I'm happy to talk about it later. Uh, but, uh, but relevant to, the, to the, the study here, though, is that the Kikuyu clients and victims of this corrupt stock brokerage don't take the news very hard. Right? So I run a series of logistic regressions that predict future investing according to whether you are a client of this corrupt broker and or a victim of this corrupt broker. Right? And when the Kikuyu investors are clients and victims of the corrupt bro broker, they continue to expand investment in the future. But for members of rival tribes and non-rival third tribes, the mere hint of corruption tends to get them to reduce shareholding in the future. So what this leads me to are, th are three quick conclusions, and then I'll, I'll turn it over. First of all, tribal relationships play a very strong role uh, in legitimating stock market ownership in Kenya, which leads us to questions of fragmented market development. Policymakers might want to be aware of elements of the local community that either strengthen this social segmentation or can attenuate it, but then third, levels of corruption or the way corruption <laughs> tends to unplay in the, uh, uh, play out in this market seems to actually be making it worse. The tribal minorities that you're trying to recruit into the market are also the first ones to exit when corruption, when corruption rears its head. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks for, thanks for your time.